Ah, Community Matters here on a given Thursday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and that's Steve Petranik, Hawaii Business Magazine. We call it Hawaii Business. Yes. It's very generic that way. <laughs> we are everywhere. Digital, you social are. media, in events. So. And Steve and I uh, collaborated on a program called uh, Morning Media Symposium with the emphasis on the word media. Mm -hmm. And we looked at the media as we do, as we used to do under the name, what, Newsmorphosis, News you reminded me. We did two of those. And it's very important to, that we look at the media because the media is under pressure these days. Yeah. And the media, it becomes more important. It seems to me the media protects the Constitution. And if we don't have the media healthy and vibrant and vital, yes. they're at greater risk for uh, people who would like to undermine the Constitution. So uh, that, that was a great program, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. It was a great program. I agree. And, a uh, lot of good voices in there, intelligent conversation. Yeah, the test is always whether you come up with stuff you never thought before. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> And, and we had a really wide range of people, and uh, uh, people in for-profit media, people on the outside. We had a lot of lawyers and asking First Amendment questions in the audience. We talked about whether you can how to pay for news because news is, is fake news is real cheap. You can make I, you and I can make up a whole. We could do a, a, a lots and lots of fake news for nothing. Um, good news takes a lot of money. Reporting video, whatever you need to do. And so that was a huge consideration because the money going into real news media is less and less nowadays. Yeah, we live in, in very hard times as far as the media is concerned. And it, it, it signifies that it's going to get harder. It'll be harder I going so. forward. I think so. Um, it's interesting. So um, I looked up some stats on, um, you know, when you talk about digital native newsrooms. And I guess this is a digital native newsroom because the, your platform is social media, is the web, that sort of thing. Civil Beat's another digital native newsroom. BuzzFeed, uh, Vice, those are all digital native. They're really growing. That, that, from 2008 to today, they added 13,500 newsroom jobs in that segment of the media. So that's a great growth. However, the losses in newspaper newsrooms in the same period, we're, more than, we're about double that. Uh, we're more than double that, 33,000 jobs I've lost. seen that number, yeah. So, so if you're talking about the total number of news jobs, it's, it is declining. But it's growing in some areas and declining fast in others. Clearly print media, print news room, breaking news, is declining. Um, we've been flat in the, at Hawaii Business. Our circulation is flat in print and it's growing enormously in digital. So we are, but, but print newspapers, I mean, they can't survive. If they're built on news, you already know what's in your newspaper every morning if you've been paying attention. Yeah, 12 hours to, earlier you found out, so it's right. old news. So um, the medium is not quite right. Um, print is better for the deeper stories, the ones that are more meaningful and that you, when you have time to, to spend with print, then a magazine is a better format for it. Uh, there's the talk of when you're on digital and you're reading digital news, you're leaning into it. It's really, you know, short and your, your time frame and your attention span is shorter. When you do spend time with print, you're sort of leaning back and giving it some time to think. And, and that's, that's where we... We target that sort of audience with Hawaii Business yeah. Magazine. Let me make a guess and say that the people who read those long stories uh -huh. are, um, are a different crowd than the people who get off on the short stories. Right. And, uh, the, and there are not as many people who read the long stories because the way we live, you know, in our, high, in our hyped up world, mm -hmm. uh, we want it fast. We want it now. We want as much of it as we can possibly get. Um, the long stories, um, you know, take too much time. So... I, I think that probably there will always be some people who want to read long stories. Right. But it's, it's right now, I think it's in a shrink mode. Uh, but yeah. let me add this, though. Sometimes you go on the web, like for the New York Times, Washington Post, uh -huh. and you have a headline that's very catchy. Right. You have a first few paragraphs, very catchy. It, it, you, know, you could treat that as a short story. But then you keep on reading. <laughs> and, you, and then you keep on reading and reading and reading. You find out... This is not a short story at all. Uh -huh. This is a story that's going on for 10,000 words. Yeah. This is pretty good. And so you have a kind of choice with some of these newspapers that have gone online. 
Uh, well, absolutely. And there, uh, one of the principles of news writing was the inverted pyramid. So you know what a pyramid, of course, and inverted, that means that the most important stuff has to go at the top. So you're reading that long story. You've got to make sure that it's organized in a way so that if you're only going to read those three paragraphs, you get the essential point. Keep reading, you're still getting more and more. And then the least important stuff is towards the bottom. And if you give up before then, you know, you've missed something, but you haven't missed the essence of the story. Um, it, it's a, a challenge to write that way well, but um, a lot of media have learned how to do that. You know, we've talked um, to you, going back to the original news morphosis, mm -hmm. about, um, they didn't call it fake news then, but, you know, the quality of the news oh, you're yeah. getting and the need to apply critical thinking on what you're reading and, and to select publications that are giving you the straight scoop and not, you know, don't have an agenda that uh, they're not necessarily telling you about. And, um, you know, I, I think, you know, there's, there's, um, there's, there's an interesting third dimension to that. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's what stories do you cover? Yeah. You, know, you can cover the, the de rigueur kind of stories, what's going on in the hearings and, mm -hmm. and how are things in Iran, uh, like that, you know, the stories that require you to treat it as a thread. But there's other stories that pop up that don't necessarily get, you know, in, in the media that you're looking at. Because that media, you know, doesn't treat it as a priority story, doesn't catch it, or doesn't think it's important enough. So when you evaluate the media, you also have to evaluate them, not only for credibility, not only for, you know, agenda, but also for priorities. What, what, do, they, what do they want to cover? What are they, in fact, covering? What are they not covering? Well, you see, one of the things, I think one of the reasons President Trump was elected is because he created an entertainment out of his, his rallies. And, and political politics has always been a little bit of entertainment. You know, people would go out for the Lincoln-Douglas debates, but then it was substantive. So that the point where, and a lot of, when, when the impeachment hearings started going live, you had TV critics calling them boring. You know, well, there's no, you know. Uh, you need smoking guns well, here. Well, you need <laughs> entertainment. <laughs> and that's the reality that President Trump, as well as others, have created this thing where if it's not explosive every time, people are going to get, well, this is boring. No, no, that news is not supposed to be entertaining. It's, it's supposed to be important and it's supposed to be revealing. So if, if your model is an entertainment model, you're going to only, if, if that's what you're picking your stories based on, the entertainment model, you're not going to give, be giving people a good sense of the news and the importance of, of a subject. I mean, when I, I was thinking back to the Army McCarthy hearings, and I'm dating myself. I, I wasn't alive then, but I, I know that changed America when they went on TV. If you showed that today, people would, no one would watch because they were incredibly uh, slow moving. Tedious, yeah. But you had, incre you had America on uh, on TV then, the, between Joe McCarthy and, and, and people like Marshall, General Marshall, and, and the, um, America was at stake then. America's at stake right now. It's not supposed to be entertainment, America. It's supposed to be the, the, the principles of democracy and, and truth and, and all these things that, that are so important. And our future are together on the planet. Right. <laughs> now, news, I'll make a distinction between entertaining news and engaging news. Now we have to write it well. We have to make every word count. We have to be call the the the, the you know the unnecessary stuff out of it and, and make it compelling. Make your time matter so that when you're investing your time in the news, you get the best possible account of it. But don't look for entertainment here. Turn on Netflix if you want entertainment. Don't go to the news for entertainment. Go to the news for the future of democracy and the future of our for our children and and uh, our planet, those are the issues you should be looking for. Yeah. Regrettably, our, our educational system over the past 50 years, maybe 70 years, hasn't really taught people, taught the whole country mm -hmm. that they are part of the government, the government is part of them, they have to care about it because ultimately it will affect their lives and fortunes. I don't think a lot of people really deal in that realm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, let me pick up on one of the things you said, you know, Netflix is always entertaining. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's their business model. Right. It's got to be entertaining. But there's a lot of stuff 
on Netflix that are either, quote, documentary mm -hmm. or fiction emulating fact. You yeah. know, a series that deals with something that happened in government. Uh, the Madam Secretary is, a, is, is one example I would give. You know, here's the Secretary of State. These are the kinds of things that happen. And it's just like the kinds of things that you, you see happening in real life. Mm -hmm. and, and it's a blurred line. I think there's been a blurred line for a long time. Right. You know, between the fact and the fiction that emulates the fact. And it's very confusing for somebody who has not been trained yeah. to distinguish those two. So you're getting all these messages and cues from the fiction that you carry into your perception of the fact. Right. Well, I think that, so when me, people say, I don't trust the media, I ask, which medium right. are you talking about? Because media is a plural noun, and it includes everything from Hollywood blockbusters to Facebook to my magazine, and a million things in between. So, um, I, you know, it's, it's, it's similar in a way to that question that's often asked by pollsters, do you, do you trust Congress? And, you know, Congress usually gets down to 16%, a pretty low rating. Do you trust your individual representative? Yes, that's a much, often a much higher ranking. So people trust media that they trust, you know. Uh, they trust Hawaii Business Magazine. They trust... Maybe they trust Civil Beat, or they trust the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. And they trust Think Tech. And they yeah. trust Think Tech. So they, <laughs> they're, they're, there's certain things that they come to depend on for their news. So I don't know that I've entirely answered your question, but, but I think it's important to understand this notion that there's a million different sources out there. Pick wisely. My wife teaches journalism at UH, and one of the things she teaches is media literacy. And sadly... Uh, young people have a hard time distinguishing what you're saying between advertising, between PR, between opinion, and between news. They have no, and she's trying to teach them that. And it's really hard because they've grown up in, in an environment where, where PR tries to sound like news and opinion tries to sound yes. like, you know, fake news tries to sound like real news. And, and it's doing a pretty good job of, 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 um, fooling persuading people. people, fooling people. Thank you. That was the word I was looking for. Persuading people, fooling people. Well, you get the whole PR phenomenon. There are professionals. There are far more professionals in PR than there are in reporting. Yes, that was. So, and then you read, you read, and I won't name the names of media, but you read these stories that are supposed to be news stories, and you say, wait a minute, this sounds like PR. Yeah. Well, it is PR because what happened is the PR person for American Money wrote the thing, sent it to the paper as a press release, what have you, mm -hmm. and a young reporter took it wholesale and made it into an article without changing very much at all. Mm -hmm. Result is that PR is made into news. News is PR. Right. And it's got a big agenda, and uh, it, it hasn't been vetted. It hasn't been fact-checked. But there it is. The, the line, again, is blurred. Yeah. It's very problematic, I think. Well, and I, I think it's lack of resources in those newsrooms. I mean, the... There's so many fewer people. We used to have two uh, newspapers in town, in, in Honolulu, and they were bigger than, they had much bigger newsrooms, both of them, than the current one we have, the Star Advertiser, which is a, uh, a merger of the two, two papers. So it's a lack of resources. I'm, I don't want to be too self-righteous about it because you just don't have the manpower that you used to have. It, people need to understand they have to pay for news. Free news is often fake news or it's bad. You know, it's, it's just not well done. In order for people to get good news, they have to understand they have to pay for it. And, and very few people are paying for news nowadays. Yeah, and, and the lesson, to go to the educational side of this, as you mentioned, the lesson is uh, that you've, you've got to train students coming up uh, how important it is. The news is important for their democracy, the continuation of their quality of life, the improvement of their quality of life, uh, the control of government, uh, which gets, you know, gets uncontrolled sometimes. Yeah. Um, and you, 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 don't, you don't, that's some, not something you wake up in the middle of the night at the age of 40 and you realize. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's something you have to be taught, like, like your wife is teaching it. Right. But, you know, when I was a kid, we were actually in school in New York, we had a, we had a course in reading the newspaper. Oh, yeah? And it wasn't just how to handle the double fold. You know, that <laughs> yeah, was on part the subway. of it. Yeah, okay. How do you read a newspaper on a subway, right, where you fold it this way, that way? 
It was like how to pick the articles, right. um, you know, how to, how to appreciate it, how to connect the dots. And um, a, little of that, a little of that training goes a long way. Right. Unfortunately, like so many other things in schools these days, we, we have dropped that kind of thing mm -hmm. off, like music, like art, mm -hmm. like, you know, and so many other things. But I think we need that. In a democracy, we have to train those kids from a very early age, like with reading. Right. Reading, reading news, they're both connected. And, and uh, how to read a newspaper. And I guess the ultimate point, which I'm sure your wife teaches in, at the university, is that this is the key to our future. Mm -hmm. Everyone must get on board. You don't have to agree with it, but you have to know about it. Right. Um, and we don't have that. And we had better get that. Well, you know, in when um, I remember my, uh, I'm the child of immigrants, and their English was not great, but my dad would read the paper <laughs> every evening. Um, I know my mother would often read it, and um, they would watch the TV news religiously every night. That was, they felt that was their duty as a citizen. As a citizen. But, um, well, and to be honest, there were less things to do back then. Uh, you, you know, you, you had the evening paper, and, and there were three channels on TV, and everyone put the news on at the same time. So nowadays, we know there's a million different ways to, at six o'clock in the night, there's a million different things to do. I mean, possibly you could read the paper, you could read the news or watch it, but so, so many, many options. Deficits. And here's another thing, you know, what we're also up against, and, and it, 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 I think it's larger than a lot of people know, is the, you have something like Russia, which is a dictatorship, and you know, Putin and, and his oligarchs, they don't, uh, they don't need to, what, what, what their goal is, is to show that democracy is as bad as what they've got. You know, so the people in Russia, stop complaining. You know, you want democracy? Look what democracy looks like in America or in Europe, in Britain. And, and that's their goal. Their goal isn't, isn't to uh, necessary to do, uh, get Trump in office, although maybe they, they've supported that. What they wanted to do was sort of destroy the democratic process, make it so much that people would say, I, I'm not going to vote. I mean, it's a, I can't choose, but to their, everybody's a crook, everybody's lying, everybody, everything's broken down. Why should I vote? It's a waste of time. That, when that happens, the Russians win. That's the Chinese, why. The Chinese win. Um, but we have a democracy, and it's better than those systems, but we have to make it work. It does take effort. That's why it's so, so nefarious to say the press is the enemy of the people. Yeah. It's like saying we're our own enemies. Let's divide up. I think another thing that sprung out of what you what we were talking about a minute ago, like your parents, it's a story that's worth looking at. Why did they feel it was their duty as a citizen? You know, the, the, the immigration service didn't tell them that, but they picked it up somewhere. They decided that it was their duty as a citizen was like pay back to the country right. to be you know, actively engaged in the, in the community conversation. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, they, they picked it up. They realized that it would it help them in the, in the integration into the, but it was also going to help them in their careers. Uh, and one other thing, and this mm -hmm. is the critical thing, yeah. they could talk to people. They were educated enough mm -hmm. so they could have a conversation about their views of things with yep. anybody. And I think over time, um, you know, we've lost some of that. We were in little silos, little social media silos. Right, we right. only talk to the telephone. Mm -hmm. and we don't talk to people like you and I are talking right now, exchanging ideas like that and views. We may not agree. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that we, it, it, you have to have that kind of communication. Uh, a, it helps to read the paper and do discerning reading of the news. Mm -hmm. But B, um, it's part of that same fabric of understanding that we're all in this together. Right. And which your parents, and, and the, the, the last point I would make in, in, in uh, free association here, <laughs> <laughs> is that by doing that, when your father sat, sat in his armchair after dinner, read the paper, he talked to you, didn't he, Steve? Oh yeah, he scolded me once for my life. <laughs> I made a comment about a, a particular government official, and he said, no, that, that, that's wrong, you know, and I was wrong.
and he called me out on that. He communicated all that stuff to you. Yeah. And it made you a journalist. Or well, beyond that, it made you a responsible citizen, too. That's exactly it. You have an obligation. It's not a one-way street. You don't just have rights as a citizen. You have obligations as a citizen. That's obligate. The, the, almost the lowest form is the obligation to vote. It goes beyond that. It's, it's to, to engage in the public discourse with your neighbors, with your friends. With, with people at work. Test it's your to be, ideas. Yeah, and to, to be engaged in what the important matters are, and then to speak out on, not just to be silent. Yeah. And so, but it is, the first word is obligation. It's an obligation as a citizen, and, and um, I, I don't know that people as much feel that obligation anymore. I know, I know among immigrants it's very strong because they have, they have volunteered to come here, and they have often come from some places much worse. And they work hard to do the right thing. Right. That's, what, that's why immigrants are so important to the country. I think so. They're so, you know, some of our best citizens, many right. of our best that's, citizens. Absolutely. So now we're at the point, we have a few minutes left here. Now we're at the point where we have to ask ourselves affirmatively what to do. What to do in the media, what to do in the public. Because I think this is, um, it's, you know, we have a divisive problem. Part of that is we're in silos and we don't want to sort of shake the tree with the guy who we know feels differently. Um, we don't want to come to a consensus. We don't want to have a vote, really, uh, and have that conversation. Um, the country has, um, as a matter of culture, gone off the track this way. Um, to get back won't be easy. The yeah. media definitely part of it. What do we do? What do we do as part of the media? What do we do as citizens? It's, it's it, you know, we talk a lot about news bubbles. When you're in your news bubble, you're only hearing what you want to hear or what you already know, and it's being reinforced. And other people are in there. The biggest problem is not the bubbles. That is a problem, but it's partisanship. It's an inability. You're a Republican. I'm a Democrat. We're never talking. And those building those relationships and real relate warm relationships, not yelling at each other relationships. That starts to break down the barriers. That more than getting out of your news bubble. Let me give you an example. You know, we talk about Fox News or MSNBC being very partisan, and they are. But way more people watch the six o'clock evening national news still. And that, those uh, shows aim to be centrist. And this, you have Republicans and Democrats watching the same news and coming away with very different perspectives. <laughs> You've got Democrats seeing what's going on in Washington, they're saying that's an impeachable offense. And you have Republicans saying that's a nothing burger. So it's not the news bubble that's the worst problem. It is a problem, but the worst problem is partisanship and, and we not having relations anymore with uh, people we disagree with. And we have to build those up. So I think it's very important to start talking to people who you disagree with and, and not yelling, listening, and talking, Maybe you're not going to change their mind or they yours, but you've built a relationship and maybe it's a relationship of trust and you can find common ground. Let me offer a thought on that. I mean, I've been trying to think this all through. Um, and what, I, what, I've, what I've come to uh, well, is I'm very, very patriotic. Mm -hmm. now, although I went to law school, I understood about the branches of government before I went to law school. That was... That was part of my pre-law school training, and I'm, I was sensitive to it then, and I'm even more sensitive to it now, about trying to keep the, the machine going properly, you know, healthy, all that. Um, and so last week, Colbert, one of my favorites, um, gets on with a couple of musicians, and they decide they're going to sing America the Beautiful. Um, Ray Charles' rendition, right? oh, you know, mm -hmm. who made that song famous. And um, they sang it, and they sang it with a jazz overlay, a very American rendition of America. Yes. You know? <laughs> and it touched me. And I realized something. It really touched me. Mm -hmm. In fact, every time I hear that song, let's not sing it now, Steve. But <laughs> <laughs> every time I hear that song, I am touched. I mean, really emotionally touched. Yeah. And mm, here's the point that comes out of it is that aside from the silo and aside from the you know, divisiveness and unwilling to, to have a conversation and rejecting the other side ad, ad hoc, I mean, out of, out of hand, um, there's something else too. You have to believe in the country. 
You have to believe in the social fabric that overarches any particular political position you want to take. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you start out with the notion that this is, the, my mother would say, this is the greatest country in the world. Mm -hmm. Be thankful to God every day that you live here, you were born here, you know? Mm -hmm. um, we have to all see that as the fundamental point. You never even get to these questions of the media and the silo and the divisiveness. First, you have to understand and agree that patriotism overall. Right. Of a country that is from sea to sea, not this area, not the, what some people call the real America. The real America is everything. The real America is everything from Brooklyn to San Francisco to Iowa to North Dakota. It's all America. And that's always been that way. We have always been a country of many different types of people, many different types of places. And that's why it's a great country. Yeah. The other point is immigration, by the way. I, I get a similar reaction mm -hmm. when I hear uh, the Emma Lazarus poem, mm -hmm. um, you know, give me your tired, huddled, you know, yearning to be free. Yeah. Um, that also touches me because I, I believe that that's part of this recipe you're talking so you want to know my solution? Yes, See, please. See how you think about it. Okay. One of the biggest mistakes the country ever made, and it was in reaction to Vietnam, was terminating the draft. Because ah, yes. in the military, you get to rub shoulders with everyone. Absolutely. You get to understand them. You get to like them. You get to feel there's a common bond. And that carried through a number of generations, the greatest generation after yeah. the war. The greatest generation was polyglot. Yes. It wasn't just a bunch of old howdy guys, no, it was polyglot. No. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we need to do that. And how do you do that? You need national service of some kind. That is an interesting idea. We did lose a lot when we lost the draft. And it would be nice if we brought it back to include women in it. So that it, <laughs> Touché. I, I mean, there is a, uh, um, because that's one of the divides we have in our country between uh, the way men think and the way women, the reality women are living in. So. Interesting solution. Can you bring it back, the draft? Uh, well, <clears throat> you're going to have a lot of young people out there who are going to oppose it. Yeah, well, it's about, it's about public service. I mean, it was, yes, it was about the war, and we were throwing men into a war that was uh, very painful and lot, 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 lost their lives. Uh, if, if it becomes a more of a public service, the draft is a, for public service, which may include military service and maybe... People will think differently. All things considered, the program, Morning Media Symposium, mm -hmm. the news that you read and write about every day, you live more than really anybody I know. You live in a world of news. You are sensitive to everything that's happening to you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> and, and then, of course, uh, all the, you know, the concerns, um, optimism, pessimism about where this country is going. Wrap it all together. Let me ask you, how do you feel about the future? Are we going to be okay? Well, people often draw a comparison between this time and the pre-Civil War and then a Civil War itself. And that is, I think, a valid uh, concern. We have people who can't talk to each other because their understanding of the world we live in is so very different. We got through the Civil War. Um, what we also face, and this I think terrifies me even more, is climate change and the, the wrenching choices that we'll have to make that climate change will force upon us, um, including literally hundreds of million, if not billions of, a billion climate refugees from places all over the world which be, be no longer be habitable. And those people will come knocking at our door and how we deal with that. So. Um, I am an optimist by nature. I think we will get through it because I've no history and we have gotten through things that have been this worse, this bad before. But uh, I see so many huge challenges. And I hope that as a member of the news media, I, hate, I hope to help break down those barriers that allow America to be one country again and to be one country united in a moving forward because we have done that even in spite of partisan differences, we have had shared agendas that allowed us to move forward and become great. Maybe even one world together. <laughs>
you know, let, let's fix this one first and then see how we, how we work to go after that. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Steve Petranik, Hawaii Business Magazine. Thank you so much. Enjoyed it so Next much. Next time soon. Okay.